So today we are discussing the therapeutic agents for the reproductive system, chapter 24. This can be found in the Mosby Pharmacy Technician Principles and Practice Book. Based on this chapter, uh, by the end of this lecture, you should be able to describe the anatomy and physiology of the reproductive system. You should also be able to list the primary signs and symptoms of common conditions that's associated with the reproductive system. Today we'll be going over some of the examples of the conditions and some of the medications that help treat the conditions. So you should be able to recognize prescription and over-the-counter drugs as used to treat common conditions of the reproductive system, as well as be able to write the generic and brand names for the medications discussed, as well as be able to list appropriate auxiliary labels when filling prescriptions for the medications that we will be discussing in this chapter. So to start off talking about the reproductive system, we are going to first start off by talking about the female reproductive system. So the female reproductive system produces and transports ova from ovary through the fallopian tubes and into the uterus. This is where the fertilized ovum is housed. Now, within the female reproductive system, it usually, as far as hormones and things like that, um, after puberty, the female ovary matures one egg per month. And so all eggs are inside of the woman's, um, uh, what is it called? <laughs> ovary. Yes, all of the eggs are in the ovaries at birth. So all of the eggs that a woman will ever need, or should I say ever have, are already inside of her when she's born. Now, the eggs are not produced, but they are matured. So at birth, a girl is born with almost 1 million eggs. Um, and by puberty, about half of those remain. So during a woman's reproductive life, about 400 eggs are released uh, to get a more um, uh, picture of what I'm referring to, you can refer to figure 24.1. So in continuing talking about the female reproductive system, we will learn that um, the mature egg is gathered by permeated ends of the infundibulum of the fallopian tubes. And so in ovulation, the oocyte uh, is propelled into the fallopian tube where uh, fertilization takes place. So the ovum is only viable for about 24 to 48 hours, and this is where the uterus houses the fertilized ovum. So when there is no fertilization, the endometrial layer sloughs off as menses. And so with menses, uh, you have the menstrual cycle, which begins at puberty, and it's known to continue for until the woman turns 40 years or until menopause. So for couples trying to receive um, shortly before or at the time of ovulation is more effective than intercourse after ovulation. So that's why you'll see some uh, women actually try to purchase, um, there are these over-the-counter uh, ovulation tests that can kind of let them know when they're most fertile. And so uh, in the pharmacy, you might see some women asking, uh, about those particular uh, testing devices, which it could be found over the counter near the pharmacy area. So premenopause is the term that's given to the years immediately prior to menopause. And this happens when symptoms such as hot flashes and irregular or skip periods generally begin. Uh, for more of a picture of this reference, you can refer to figures 24.2 and uh, figures 24.3. Uh, as an example. So I kind of gave a bit of an example in regards to the female reproductive system. Now let's learn about the female reproductive hormones. So GnRH um, is from the anterior pituitary, <laughs> which secretes hormones necessary for ovulation. Um, for the FSH, which stands for follicle stimulating hormone, and LH, which stands for luteinizing hormone, those particular hormones stimulate the ovaries to secrete estrogen and progesterone. So you should know two of the main hormones in the female reproductive system 
is estrogen and progesterone. Now, for major female hormones, you have the estrogen and the progesterone, which are secreted from the anterior pituitary gland. Uh, for more information on this, you can also refer to table 20. Experience in the lower abdomen at the time of ovulation. I myself have even heard of people say, like right before their menstrual comes on, you know, I can feel myself ovulating. Now I'm in touch with my body, but I have never actually, I, I don't have that experience. I don't know when I'm ovulating, but um, that's interesting to me, but it is known that some women can actually experience pain when uh, they are um, at the beginning of ovulation. So now that we've talked a little bit about some of the female reproductive hormones, we'll next talk about the mammary glands. And when we refer to the mammary glands, um, we're referring to the breast or known as the breast tissue. And these are regulated by our hormonal secretions. Now at puberty, uh, the mammary glands can increase in estrogen, which stimulates the development of glandular tissue. Now with the progesterone, that stimulates the development of the duct system, which could be used uh, during the production of milk, uh, better known as uh, the lactation uh, process. Uh, now, did you know, here's a, a interesting, here's a good question to uh, start thinking about. Did you know that some medications are excreted in the breast milk? This is the part where you'll take yourself off mute and let me know uh, what your answer is. Is ready? Yes. Um, this is Paula. Actually, um, I had um ulcer, and they were giving me I don't know what kind of medication it was, but I, it was like hormones for hormones, and and I actually I mean I had my baby in two thousand seven, and somehow mm -hmm. it was producing milk, and I was like, wait, am I pregnant? And I went back to the doctor and I said it had to do to the medication I was taking, so I stopped taking it. Okay. Maybe that's what you're. You because it made it made you produce milk. Is that my understanding? Yes, it made me produce milk, so I stopped taking it. And I actually went to the doctor to get tested if I was pregnant or not. Okay. Yeah, uh, so. In this in this regard, it's uh it's the question of did you know that when patients take medicine, sometimes that medicine can be excreted into the breast milk, which is why it's important when mothers are pregnant or breastfeeding uh, they have to be very aware of the medicines that they're taking because it could go to the baby so that's right. why you have different um pregnancy categories uh and yeah. categories category d and x um so for pregnancy category a that means there is no uh, no known okay. harm, no known, um, uh, no known issues that would happen if the person takes the medicine. Um, B is, um, you know, it might be, it's a possibility, you know, that it could be, you know, harmful. C is definitely, you want to use caution. Uh, this is how I remember the pregnancy categories. Uh, pregnancy category D, do not use at all. And category X, like absolutely not. Stay away. Do not pass go. Do not collect $200. That's literally how I think of the pregnancy categories when it comes to uh, that information. But um, oftentimes the pregnancy category that's given to a medication um, indicates the drug's non-use if excretion does occur. And so, uh, to, to get a more uh, picture of this example, you can refer to figure 24.5 in your book. So we talked a little bit about memory glands. Next, we'll learn about some of the conditions that affect the female reproductive system. So within the female reproductive system, we have female hormones, which are used in treating conditions of male reproductive tract. Um, this would include prostate or um, testicular cancer. Now with male hormones, those are used to treat endometrial or breast cancer, um, endometriosis and fibrocystic diseases in females. With estrogen, it's the dominant form of medical therapy and it also um, works by treating the hormone replacement, um, 
an abnormal uterine bleeding, abnormal ovulation, as well as infertility. I believe in one of the lectures I did previously, we discussed how uh, men and women, the hormones in men and women, um, uh, something along the lines of uh, there is times where the male, some of the hormones or something could be like uh, changed, like the women uh, could take, I want to say the male hormones and then, let me not confuse you, but it's something we read or something I kind of went over before. Um, but continuing talking about some of the conditions that affect the female reproductive system, uh, we'll first learn about estrogen. So estrogen is the main use in um, oral contraception. Um, it affects the bone and the cardiovascular function. It works by reducing the levels of low density lipoproteins. It also raises the levels of high density lipoproteins. Uh, estrogen also lowers the risk of cardiac disease, and it also supports the development and maintenance of reproductive organs. Estrogen, estrogen can come in many dosage forms. Um, it can be administered uh, via injectable, oral, or transdermal. Uh, anytime you hear the word transdermal, that represents a patch um, because it's going to be something that's going to be applied to the skin. Now, with estrogen, um, estrogen is any group of anabolic sex hormones that promote the development and maintenance of the female sexual uh, characteristics. That's actually the term and definition. By promoting tension of calcium, phosphorus, or the bone production. And in females, it also treats the hypo um, gonadism. Um, it also works by uh, treating postpartum breast engorgement or lactation. Uh, estrogen helps with uh, symptoms of menopause, um, endometriosis, as well as dysfunctional uterine bleeding. Now, in males, if a male is prescribed estrogen, it's used for inoperable prostate and testicular cancers. Now, some of the adverse effects of estrogen would include um, uh, it aggravates asthma, epilepsy, uh, migraines, heart disease, uh, urinary tract diseases, and also some symptoms of diabetes. And so some of the common symptoms of menopause would include hot flashes, um, irregular or missed periods, as well as vaginal dryness. And so with many women who, ex who experience um, the increased number of headaches, um, it's known statistically that there are many women who experience um, headaches, a number of headaches immediately before and during uh, they have their periods. And so these headaches can usually be treated with an NSAID. Remember, an NSAID stands for non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug. Uh, they could also, the migraines uh, or the headaches can also be treated with other drug classes such as triptans, um, for an example, uh, uh, sumatriptan, which is the generic of Imitrex, and then uh, there are sometimes where a patient might use both uh, NSAID and a triptan. So I gave you an example of a triptan. Who can give me an example of what an NSAID is? Yes. Advil, who said Advil or Aleve, those are also examples of NSAIDs. So um, uh, that would be helpful. Uh, so continuing talking about uh, the different conditions uh, of the female reproductive system, we'll learn about female hypogonadism. And so that is basically a lack of production of estrogen in the ovaries. Uh, some symptoms of this particular condition include loss of menstruation, hot flashes, loss of body hair, loss of libido, that means uh, their sex drive is low. Um, a person could also experience infertility, uh, which basically means uh, it's difficult for them to get pregnant. Um, and then they could also experience early menopause. Now the treatment um, for this particular condition it deters the causes of these conditions. And so the drug treatment 
uh, would be um, HRT, which represents hormone replacement therapy. So maintaining an ideal body weight, eating healthy and refraining from smoking, as well as adhering to an exercise regimen might also improve infertility. Now with estrogen and progestin, those are used for hormone replacement and they, they may also help ovarian, ovarian stimulation. And so a low dose testosterone may help by increasing the sex drive. So that's why I was referring to the loss of libido. And you can refer to figure 24.6 for more um, information on this particular. So continuing about more conditions, we learned about estrogen being used uh, for some of the conditions. Um, one of the other conditions is the female hypogonadism. Another condition is infertility. And the prognosis of infertility actually depends on the patient's age, the cause of the condition, as well as the treatment methods. And so if a person is experiencing infertility, hormone treatment is the most common. So some of the medications that could be used if a person is experiencing infertility would include drugs such as Clomid, which its generic is clomiphene. Um, other medications would include um, Perganol, and there are some other hormones. Um, these all can be used to increase ovulation. And so uh, with the fertility agents, those are given to promote um, maturation of the graphene follicle and also the production of the ovulation. So with fertility drugs, those tend to increase the occurrence of multiple pregnancies. That's why sometimes when you hear women who say that they went to an infertility specialist, they sometimes um, come with uh, either, you know, I've seen people have twins or triplets, or, you know, you'll hear about people having quadruplets or sextuplets. Um, and so this is less of a risk with the oral clothamine than with some injectable fertility drugs. And so based on this information, we learned that fertility drugs tend to increase the occurrence of multiple pregnancies because you have to remember it's increasing the ovulation. So there is a possibility of more eggs being dropped into the fallopian tube where when the sperm meets the egg, they all get fertilized. So continuing learning about other uh, information when it comes to the female reproductive system. You cannot talk about the female reproductive system without talking about oral contraceptives. Oral contraceptives is the medical term for saying birth control. Um, the abbreviation for birth control is BC, and so oral contraceptives, they're going to be taking birth control by mouth. Uh, these are relatively safe for non-smokers or uh, people of normal cardiovascular function. It is a very dangerous thing for a person to be taking birth control and also smoking because that is going to have some serious effects. So there is a combination of estrogen and progestin, which inhibits ovulation. And the progestin only is called mini pills. And so there is combinations of oral contraceptives that are more frequently prescribed and they're almost 100% effective. But I will tell you, and this is not me counseling, this is just my own um, belief. The only 100% thing to prevent pregnancy is abstinence. But let's continue talking about the lecture. So it's very important to take progestin only pills at the same time every day to maximize their effectiveness. So that's why you'll also hear women when they uh, come, when they go to the pharmacy and pick up their birth control, they're usually always on time with that because they have to take it the same time every single day. So you may hear some people have some alarms. You may hear some people say they have some type of regimens or some routines. So this is all in that focus of taking the medicine at the same time every day because they have had a conversation with their physician who has told them the uh, the greatest effects of how to maximize the oral contraceptive, which is to take it every single day at the same time. And for more information on this, you can also refer to figure 24.7. So continuing to learn more about the oral contraceptives, 
I shared with you in the previous slide that most oral contraceptives actually are, uh, they have a combination. So when I say they have a combination, I'm referring to they have two drugs that's working together. So the combinations usually include a monophasic, which is daily doses of estrogen and progestin, which remain consistent or yet constant throughout the menstrual cycle. Um, you have biphasic, which is estrogen, which remains constant. And then the progestin dose is increased in the second half of the cycle. So, and then you have a triphasic, which is where the menstrual cycle is divided into three phases and the amount of progestin is constant, but the estrogen is gradually increased throughout the cycle. So this may seem like a lot, but with the oral contraceptives, you'll see them uh, either in a 21 day supply of the medicine, or you'll see a 28 uh, blister card of the medicine. And so um, there are some side effects when it comes to oral contraceptives and some side effects include um, embolism, um, which could mean blood clotting, um, an increase uh, myocardial infarction, and that's the medical term for a heart attack or a stroke. Now, contraceptives may also increase the blood sugar level, and there it may be, it may have some precursors to gallbladder disease, and it could cause acne and um, hirsutism. Hirsutism. We would have to look that up. Here. Parasitism, yes. Uh, we would have to uh, look that up to get a better definition of what that refers to. So as we talk about the oral contraceptives, we'll learn some of the effectiveness of oral contraceptives is that the medication is started on the fifth day of the menstrual cycle, and it should be taken at the same for 21 days. If a single dose is missed, that means if a person has their oral contraceptive and they've been taking it every day, even for two weeks, and they miss one day, the chance of ovulation is small. However, the risk of pregnancy increases with each missed dose. So say somebody forgot Tuesday, so they forgot Wednesday, they forgot Thursday, then they remembered on Friday, mm, there's a risk of pregnancy if they continue missing doses. So ministration normally occurs sometime during the last seven days of the pill cycle. So this is when inactive pills or no pills are taken. So when I say that there is a 28 day of a blister pack, the first seven pills are usually placebos. Um, and then the last 20 and then the next 21 pills are the actual active uh, ingredient medication. So there is a form of oral contraceptives that's now available that is taken on a three month cycle. And so basically each package contains 12 weeks of active pills and then one week of inactive pills. So that's what I'm referring to. So we talk about oral contraceptives and we know that oral contraceptives means it's a birth control that's taken by mouth, but you should also know that there are other available forms of contraception. So the most common form of contraception is the oral contraceptive, which will come in a tablet and so you have different examples, which would be seasonal, orthotricycline, orthotricycline low, yes. Um, you may know some or have seen some of the commercials. There are different ones. Then you have some uh, available forms of birth control comes in a transdermal patch, and that's where they would put the patch on their arm. Um, and then you have some birth control that comes in the form of an injection. Uh, you may be you may be familiar or, or have heard of a depot shot. Uh, that's an example. And then you have another dosage form in the size, well, not the size, in the form of a of something that's to be inserted vaginally. And what I'm referring to is Nuvarin. That is a contraceptive that's to be refrigerated. Uh, that's a need to know. That particular dosage form has to be refrigerated and um, the patient would actually uh, have the Nuva ring in for three weeks and then out for one week and the week is out would be during the menstrual. Uh, there are other ways of birth control. Um, you have Mirena, um, 
you have IUDs. Uh, there are so many different forms of birth control. Um, but the advantage of some of the non oral products is that they can help the individuals who may have trouble remembering to take a pill every day. So um, those are some of the available. Sorry products. about that, Miss Redding. I got um, disconnected. I'm back on just just to let you know. Oh, OK, no worries. So those are some of the available forms of birth control. Now, there are some other contraceptive products. Um, contraceptive is all about um, preventing the risk of pregnancy. So some of the other contraceptive products would include spermicides. And so that has an active ingredient of nanox, nanoxyl, Nanoxanol 9, which is available in different types of forms, such as a foam, a jelly, a gel, a cream, a suppository, as well as a vaginal film. I'm not sure if you have ever really explored the over the counter section of the contraceptives, but it is a lot of options over there. And you just not, you just may not be aware of the different forms that a patient may be looking at. Um, there is essentially uh, it's important for the products to be used correctly um, as correct usage is essential for con uh, contraceptive efficiency and it must be applied before uh, calcis. Hmm. Um, now the other contraceptive uh, forms I talked about um, IUDs. Um, which is a uh, intrauterine device. That's something that would be actually um, inserted at the doctor's office, um, primarily at an OBGYN, um, where they would kind of like, it kind of, I, I think I want to say cl like clamps the tubes, or not clamps the tubes, but it kind of puts the hole, the IUB. They have it where it could be put either put in the arm or um, be put in the in the upper part of the vaginal to uh, near the uterus so that the eggs won't fall down. Right. Right. They put it usually in the middle of the of the cervix so that the sperm doesn't pass through mm -hmm, to reach the eggs. Um, so an example of IUD would be uh, Mirena, and then I talked about the Nuvarang being the other type of contraceptives that's available. So uh, some ready. other- Sorry to, uh -huh. Sorry to interrupt you. Sorry to interrupt you. Do yeah. you know, well, the Mirena actually does not allow your menstrual to come. Is that- right. There are some IUDs that will actually stop your menstrual or a person might have it for maybe once a year or, or twice a year. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, some other contraceptive products would include a barrier device, which uh, there are different types of barrier devices, such as male and female condoms. You have cervical caps, and then you even have diaphragms. Um, now, the male condom is the most frequently used, and these are made of three materials, which would include latex, polyurethane and lamb intestine. Now, I will be honest, I did not know that, that that was made out of all of those ingredients. Continuing, uh, the female condom is a loose fitting polyurethane pouch. Um, now with the lamb intestine condoms, those are reported to be less effective for preventing STDs, known as sexually transmitted disease. Um, and so, that's why you'll see on commercials it says uh, these are primarily used to prevent the risk of pregnancy, but is not used as a um, a guard to prevent against um, it does is not a hundred percent for uh, preventing uh, STDs. Um, now, we cannot talk about contraceptives without talking about emergency contraceptives. And so emergency contraceptives is better known as the morning after pill. And so uh, this is this would be a medication that is taken after a person has had intercourse and maybe they did not have 
uh, protection and it's more effective if they take the first dose the morning after um, or with at least within 72 hours of unprotected intercourse. And then the second dose is taken 12 hours after the first intercourse. So uh, one of the main uh, emergency contraceptive medications is called Plan B, uh, One Step, which is an emergency pill. And it's uh, basically a large dose of levonorgestrel, and it's available in a single dose tablet. Uh, now, it is very, very important to understand the morning after pill is not to be considered as birth control. It is a emergency contraceptive. So it is very dangerous for someone to use a emergency contraceptive as a form of birth control, meaning um, like if they take it every single week, like that's going to have some damaging effects. Not counseling, but just it's an emergency dose. Um, so there are some effects to continuing to take that. So as we continue to talk about um, emergency contraceptives, uh, you have uh, different types of medicines. You have um, mifeprex. Um, say a person uh, was um, unfortunately uh, taken advantage of and uh, there was a pregnancy that resulted of that. Um, there is an abortion pill. There is uh, something that's called anti-progestin. And so it works as being an antagonist to the progesterone, which prevents the maintenance of pregnancy. Um, this is primarily used within the first nine weeks of pregnancy for safety, and it must be administered by a qualified healthcare professional. Now, what you should know about emergency contraceptives um, is that they are a very controversial uh, topic and it's up to the pharmacist to dispense it. So you have some pharmacies. I've seen some pharmacies where the plan B or the um, or maybe the the store brand of the plan B pill is available over the counter um, where it's where the patient could have access to it and purchase it. And then I've seen other pharmacies where it's available without a prescription, but they would have to purchase it at the pharmacy counter. Uh, this is again up to the discretion of the pharmacist. So uh, just because someone goes to the pharmacy and asks for it does not always mean that they will get it because it's to the pharmacist's discretion. Um, I, in my experience as a pharmacy technician, have seen pharmacists deny it um, just based on their own uh, belief what the medicine is and them not knowing or this is their decision. So that's what I'll say. I've seen it be denied before. So we were talking about uh, emergency contraceptives. There are some side effects. So the morning after pill is a high dose contraceptive and so it's progestin only or in combination with estrogen. Uh, the progestin requires only one tablet, which is better known as the plan B uh, medicine. Now, the side effect of emergency contraceptives is that it can lead to infertility, uh, breast tenderness, chest pain, shortness of breath, blurred vision, and jaundice. So emergency contraception products do have some risk associated with them and should not be used as a regular means of birth control, which is what I was saying earlier. Uh, so continuing about some other conditions of the female reproductive system, we'll learn about menopause. And so menopause is a loss of the production of hormones that's normally produced by the ovaries. Uh, menopause is not a disease. However, medication is used to treat the side effects. Menopause is known as the change. And so it's something that happens in life. You know, as a, uh, as a female grows and uh, gets into puberty and then her menstrual starts, the menstrual ends eventually. And so when that happens, that's when menopause occurs. But again, it's not a disease. However, it's a condition and there are some side effects to that condition. Uh, we talked about it earlier. Some of the side effects of menopause would include hot flashes, um, which is the often side effect, which is why some women seek uh, medication. Um, there are some lifestyle changes that can help lessen or lessen the symptoms. And um, there is even a use of neuropathic treatments that could be helpful. Now, as far as
treatments are concerned, the drug treatment for menopause uh, would include estradiol, which is a major natural estrogen, which is produced by the ovaries and is combined with progestins. And this works by protecting women against coronary and vascular disease. Now, there are some risks associated, which could be um, thromboembolytic disease and neoplasms. Um, these are considered the most effective treatment for menopausal symptoms. Uh, the estrogen, or excuse me, the estradiol is considered the most effective treatment for menopausal symptoms, such as hot flashes, mood swings, and night sweats. Um, HRT, which is the abbreviation for hormone replacement therapy, it is used as a short-term therapy for the most severe menopausal symptoms. And so all estrogens, you should know, are considered pregnancy category X and should not and cannot be used by anyone of childbearing age. Uh, so that, what do I mean when I say that? People who are in their years of having children should not be taking uh, this particular uh, medicine. Now with soy, um, soy and black cohosh, uh, those are plant-based remedies that's used by some women as alternatives to hormone replacement therapy. You have some women who don't want to be on medicine, um, you know, based on the side effects and just their own beliefs and what they want to take. So they may take something as an alternative, um, such as soy or um, black cohosh, which can be found over the counter in the vitamin herbal section. Now, there is more research that's needed to fully understand the benefits and risks of these preparations, but these are some things that are used. So completing talking about the female reproductive system as far as conditions go, we'll talk about PID, which is the abbreviation for pelvic inflammatory disease. This is an inflammation of the female reproductive organs, and they may occur due to an STD, which is a sexually transmitted disease. Now, there are some risk factors of, of a woman um, developing PID. Um, some risk factors would include a history of PID in their family, um, perhaps their age, and then also having multiple sexual partners. Uh, for drug treatment for this particular condition would include antimicrobials and oral medications. Now, with PID, we talked about it being an inflammation of the female reproductive organs, but it's a severe inflammation of the uterine lining, the fallopian tubes, or even the ovaries that can cause pain and also permanent infertility. Now, some of the symptoms would include abnormal or increased vaginal discharge. Um, they could experience bleeding uh, between periods, some painful menstruation, painful urination, or even painful bowel movements. Um, other symptoms include fever, uh, painful intercourse, and then pain in the upper right abdomen. And you can refer to table 24.4 for more, uh, a more of a visual on this particular aspect. So now that we have talked about the female reproductive system and its conditions, we'll next talk about the male reproductive system. Uh, so you have male sex hormones, and those are stimulated by the GnRH of the anterior pituitary gland. Um, these stimulate formation of the LH, which is the luteinizing uh, hormone, um, or the FSH, which is the follicle stimulating hormone, um, with interstitial cells of the testes. These are then stimulated to secrete testosterone, and um, as we're talking about male sex hormones, um, the most abundant androgen is testosterone. So uh, the hormones in males uh, happen more in puberty, and then the androgens stimulate formation of the secondary male characteristics, which um, help by building the muscle mass, deepening the voice, and then also uh, males experiencing facial hair growth. And so the collectively, male hormones are referred to as androgens. And you can refer to table 24.5 to see more of this. So continuing talking about the um, reproductive system of the male, we'll talk about the male hypogonadism, which is where the body cannot produce enough testosterone. And this can occur in, a, in, in, in the fetus or when the person is going through puberty or even in adulthood. Um, some of the treatment for this particular condition would be stress reduction. Now, if a person is going to take 
medications, some of the drug treatment would include androgens as well as natural testosterone. Now, the medication delivery system may even promote development of secondary sex characteristics. So the increase in the sperm count is actually achieved through the increased secretion of testosterone. Um, androgens also provide a sense of well-being, mental stability, and energy to those with male hypogonadism. Um, testosterone also provides the body with a resistance to fatigue. So in learning more about the male reproductive system, we'll talk about some of the conditions, which would include benign prostatic hypertrophy. Uh, this would be better abbreviated um, uh, as uh, BPH, which stands for benign prostatic uh, hyperplasia, which basically is an enlargement of the prostate. Um, so an enlargement won't spread, um, but there are some symptoms of BPH, which would include urinary uh, hesitancy, decreased urine stream, uh, frequency of urination, as well as nocturia. Um, the treatment for BPH would include for a patient to avoid smoking, avoid alcohol, caffeine, and over-the-counter antihistamines. Um, also, um, oh, the, the uh, also the treatment could also include surgery. So one of the drug treatments, if a person is going to take a medication for BPH, would include five alpha reductase inhibitors as well as alpha blockers. So some examples of the BPH medication would include Avodart and Proscar. Um, there is There are two, there are often the two medication classes that are used concurrently to obtain the best results. And for more of a visual of this, you can refer to figures 24.11 and 24.6. So in talking about the drug classes for BPH, we talked about 5-alpha reductase inhibitor and alpha adrenergic blockers. So the 5-alpha inhibitors block the, con the conversion of the testosterone to a more active androgen. And so um, the more active one is known to increase the cell growth. Now with the alpha adrenergic blockers, those work by inhibiting the alpha-1 receptor sites. And some of these agents, and as an example, would be uh, terazosin, which its brand is Hytrin. Um, these are less selective for prostate tissue and are also used for the treatment of hypertension. So there is some cases where you'll see um, some of that as a medication. So continuing learning about more of the um, reproductive uh, male conditions, uh, we'll talk about erectile dysfunction. And so this is where there is a lack of blood flowing to the penis. And so some of the conditions that can affect the prostate gland would include diabetes, osteosclerosis, um, high blood pressure, as well as cardiovascular diseases. Now, the abbreviation for erectile dysfunction you should know is ED, and this can be a sign of a possible problem with an underlying undiagnosed condition. And so, if a person has ED, uh, using nitroglycerin and other medications for ED are prohibited. And so, uh, if a person has had a heart failure or um, has a history of cardiovascular disease, they would want to be very careful taking medications uh, for ED. And so for the drug treatment of erectile dysfunction would we'll include uh, certain medications such as uh, Viagra, which its generic is sildenafil. Uh, there are other examples of medications that can help treat erectile dysfunction, which is Cialis and Levitra. Um, and so uh, Viagra was actually introduced to the market in 1998 to treat impotence. And some of the side effects of this particular um, medication would include headaches, flushing of the skin, GI symptoms, nasal congestion, as well as diarrhea. Now patients who are on nitrates, which nitrates are primarily prescribed for patients who have a failure or who have had um, heart attacks, 
Um, they are advised to not take sildenafil because it could cause dangerous decrease in the blood pressure. And for more of a visual on this particular um, outline, you would refer to table 24.8. So in learning more conditions of the male reproduction, um, we'll also talk about prostate cancer, which its symptoms include nocteria, dysuria, um, blood in the urine or in the semen, uh, painful ejaculation, as well as pain in the pelvis or even in the lower back. And with the prostate cancer, it can be treated through surgery, radiation, as well as hormones. Now with prostate cancer, it is a serious condition and it's more treatable with newer neoplastic agents. And so when the cells grow at an uncontrollable rate in the patients with cancer, um, now unfortunately um, with patients um, who have the prostate cancer, um, it's encouraged um, that males actually uh, get their prostate checked starting at age 40 and continuing because um, early detection is, 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 is better. Um, now, with, in the African-American community, they are uh, African-Americans are actually more likely to develop this type of cancer. And so um, for a, a table to refer to, you can refer to table 24.12. So in talking about the condition of prostate cancer, we'll also talk about the drug treatment for this particular condition and with the treatment is basically determined by the stage of cancer that a person has. Uh, there is some hormone therapy which would include some anti-androgens or the LH, the luteinizing hormone. Um, also, uh, it's the combination of the LHRH, which is the luteinizing hormone with the releasing hormone agonist. And these, this particular therapy is usually started in stage two. Now these agents decrease the hormone production, which in turn slows the cell growth. And you can refer to table 24.9 for more information on that. So we talked about the female reproductive system and the male reproductive system, and we cannot complete this chapter without discussing STDs. So sexually transmitted diseases affect both males and females. Now, it is transmitted by sexual intercourse as well as non-sexually. Uh, a STD can stay hidden for long periods. Um, it's caused by bacterial, viral, fungal, and protozoal organisms. And if it is untreated, it can cause irreversible sterility, blindness, and death. And so the key to uh, prevention um, is education. Education is the key to the prevention of STDs. Um, there is even uh, some clinics that offer free STD tests, um, which is very important because everyone should know their status and know their numbers. Um, you can refer to tables 24.10, 24.11, and 24.12. And as we complete uh, discussing the reproductive system and the therapeutic agents for it, we'll lastly uh, discuss hepatitis C which um, the interferon alphas help activate certain immune cells. And so there is new uh, medications like ritinavir and um, bitazvir and other uh, medications which have more specific mechanisms of actions. And so the target key enzymes for hepatitis C is virus re replication which could result in fewer side effects and a better chance of therapy success. And so there are two recent trade name medications for hepatitis C, um, which would include Vicuripat and Har Harboni, and you can refer to table 24.12 um, for more information on this. And that is actually going to conclude our lecture for the therapeutic agents for the reproductive system.